fan Clint. And uh, he's, uh, he said he's going to be teaching on fighting sin with the power of the gospel. So please come and, and hear him. I know it'll be good. Uh, Clint is uh, not only a great teacher, he's also very funny. I don't want to put any pressure on him to be funny, but if he wants to be, he can be funny. And uh, also, uh, the following Sunday, uh, actually I'm going to be out of town again. Lee and I are going to be up in Salt Lake City doing a conference there for pastors that uh, Timothy O'Day got us roped into doing. So um, Michael Lee will be teaching for us uh, in two weeks, and uh, he's going to be teaching on the gospel and reason, uh, so it'll be interesting as well. So uh, come and support these guys and, and hear them uh, teach the Word of God to you. And then we'll resume this study uh, in three weeks uh, with the study of the 20th century, getting into the 20th century, looking at Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement. And then one final lesson after that on liberalism, neo-orthodoxy, and evangelicalism as we get into the modern era. So today we're going to be looking at the 17th century and early Baptist theology. So I want to begin by reading from the Gospel of Matthew. So turn with me to Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Here's Jesus speaking to His disciples. And He says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Let's pray. Again, we ask, Almighty Father, that you would give us insight from the past to guide us to face the challenges we have in the present. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding of your word so that we may be faithful disciples and make faithful disciples in fulfillment of the mission Christ has given us. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. I just wanted to take a quick survey of the major doctrines we have seen to this point in church history and how the history of the church has brought clarity in our understanding of a number of these issues. Uh, in the second century, we saw the doctrine of creation, how it was clarified against the Gnostic heresy. In the uh, fourth century, the doctrine of God, specifically understanding God as Trinity. In the fifth century, the person of Christ. Also in the fifth century, the issue of sin and grace. Uh, into the Middle Ages and into the Reformation, we, we see greater clarity on the doctrine of the atonement. Into the period of the Reformation, we have clarity on the nature of Scripture as the only divinely authoritative revelation from God that is with us today. And then uh, we saw justification or salvation, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> doctrine of salvation also during the time of the Reformation. So what we note here is as, as we're looking at the whole spectrum of theological issues, God has gradually given the church greater insight over the centuries, and it seems to move from topic to topic. One matter gets basically settled, and then some other matter comes up. And so that is also what happened as the Reformation progressed. Uh, the issue of, at least from our perspective, the issue of salvation uh, was largely settled in terms of understanding of justification by faith through the, Re the Reformation teaching. But the doctrine of the church, uh, we do not believe as Baptists, had come to yet a full uh, biblical understanding. And that's what we're looking at today, the doctrine of the church in particular. Uh, and this is crucial for our mission today because making disciples of all nations, which is our mission, making disciples of all nations, is really the task of planting 
and building up churches. There's no New Testament discipleship that is apart from the local church. And therefore, thriving, healthy local churches are what we need to make disciples, and they are the, the logical outcome of making disciples as well, is that those disciples will be gathered together into local bodies that are ordered according to the New Testament and that uh, function as New Testament churches. So um, it, it's also important for us to, to keep this in mind because functioning healthy churches, the, this is the means God has ordained to communicate the gospel to the world, not only through our proclamation, but through our life together. Jesus said, by this all people will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And that love is lived out in the context of the local church. And that love, that community of the local church is a powerful demonstration of the work of the gospel that is the, the platform, you might say, upon which we stand as we proclaim it to the world. So I would argue that functioning healthy local churches is absolutely essential to our fulfillment of the Great Commission. Not only that we be churches like that, but that we seek to build and plant more churches that are like that. So Baptist history shines a lot of light on what our mission is today and how we can better fulfill it. So in order to uh, get into this, I wanted to, to speak to, uh, again, the issue of the Reformation uh, in England in, in particular and how that led to the origin of the Baptist church. We've talked about two major streams thus far of the, uh, what's called the Magisterial Reformation, the Reformation that was tied up with uh, government, the state, power. Lutheranism was the more conservative wing. And uh, I didn't use this term, but, but uh, Lutherans operate according to what is called the normative principle, which means uh, they, they understand worship and church practice to be whatever the Scripture doesn't all explicitly forbid is permitted. And so that's why Lutheran churches, in the way that they worship, uh, if you went to a Lutheran church, you'd say it feels a lot like a Catholic church in the, the way that things are done. Uh, Reformed churches, on the other hand, they pushed the, the Reformation a bit farther and articulated what is called the regulative principle, which means uh, whatever is not authorized in the Scripture is forbidden. So the Lutheran approach is, if it's not forbidden, we can do it. The Reformed approach is more typically, if it's not permitted in the Scripture, we can't do it. We shouldn't think that we can. So, so there's much more structure uh, much, much more firm boundaries, you might say, on practices in the Reformed Church. Well, in England, uh, the Reformation comes by a, a bit of a different means. Uh, Henry VIII, who's king of England in the, the 16th century, ended up declaring himself head of the Church of England when he broke away from Rome. And he did so because the Pope would not grant him an annulment from his marriage. And so that's not a great way to start a church, but... That's, what, that's, that's the history of the Anglican Church. That's how it started. And uh, what ends up happening, though, is that, that frees up England to become a center for Reformed theology to make its way in. So Reformed theologians, Reformed leaders, uh, many of whom are even trained in Geneva, are coming into England, are, are seeking to bring the Church of England in a very strong Calvinist direction. And uh, that's helped along during the reign, the short reign of Edward VI. Uh, but it, there's a, a bit of a halt put on it during the reign of Mary. Uh, Mary, who's actually Catholic, so she's trying to reverse that trend. But after Mary is out of the way and Elizabeth I becomes queen, Elizabeth is a Protestant, a very strong Protestant. Uh, and it's, it happens to be convenient that um, if she were not Protestant, she would have to regard her own birth as illegitimate. Uh, which would mean she has no right to be queen. So it, it's very convenient that she's Protestant, uh, but she may have been convictionally Protestant as well. I'm not sure. But anyway, Elizabeth is a, is a Protestant queen who has a lengthy reign, and the, the uh, work of the Reformation really begins to take hold in England during her reign, and, and England becomes a very strongly Reformed country in terms of its uh, beliefs and practices at this time. However, there are still a number of Reformed leaders, theologians, who are not happy with uh, how far it has progressed. They, they wanted to push it even farther. They, they want to get rid of all of the elements of what they would call Catholic idolatry that are still going on in their worship practices. And these are the, the people we know today as the Puritans. 
the Puritans were uh, the ones who wanted to purify the Church of England and take it all the way to a, a reformed understanding and practice. And Elizabeth wasn't quite willing to go that far. So there were a number of Puritans who ended up either being forced out of the Church of England or voluntarily leaving the Church of England. And these are Puritans we call separatists today or dissenters. They, they end up starting their own churches. And the pilgrims who came uh, on the Mayflower over here in 1620 are separatists uh, from the Church of England. So once you've broken free from the state church, you've got a little bit of freedom at this point now to start thinking, okay, what else could we change? How far can we push this? Uh, and where does the Bible actually lead us to go? And so among some of these dissenting groups, you have some who begin to say, you know what? We ought to baptize those who profess faith. Uh, and, and then you, it started in that sense. So there, there may have been some churches that would baptize both infants and those who profess faith. And then it got pushed even farther to, no, we should baptize only those who profess faith. And this is the beginning of the Baptist church. Uh, as they sought to, to conform their practices more to Scripture, uh, they pushed the Reformation project farther along. And there ended up being two streams of Baptists in uh, England in the, the uh, 17th century. Uh, the, the first stream to rise was known as General Baptists. And they were called General Baptists because they believed in a general atonement, which, which in other words, they believed Christ died uh, to pay for the sins of all. And we talked about that last week with Reformed theology. In other words, the General Baptists, these were Arminian Baptists. Uh, and they began in 1609, the very first General Baptist church planted in 1609, uh, planted by a man named... It's, it's, very, it's interesting that the, the, pretty much the founder of Baptist, the Baptist church has such a simple, generic name, John Smith. However, it's spelled with a Y, so that makes it a little bit distinct. All right, so John Smith gathered a group of uh, like-minded believers who, who thought that, that baptism should only be applied to believers, gathered a group to himself in England, but he feared state persecution because of his beliefs and ended up taking his group to Amsterdam. And uh, he ended up baptizing himself first, that's weird, and then his congregation and formed the very first Baptist church, a general Baptist church, uh, and Smith, he had some strange views on things. He ended up actually repudiating what he had done later and joined with the Mennonites because uh, he thought they actually had it, they had this all together before I did, so they're the true church and, and we're the ones who messed up. So Smith ends up abandoning the project that he started, but he had a, a co-laborer named Thomas Ellis, which is uh, spelled a little different. Looks like Helwes to us, but that's probably pronounced Ellis. And a Thomas Ellis ends up bringing uh, the remainder of that group, the group that didn't go with John Smith to the Mennonites. Um, he brings them back to England, and they have the first Baptist church on English soil at that point. By the way, the Mennonites are, are a, group called, a group of Anabaptists, which the Anabaptists predate the Baptists. Very similar in their understanding, but, but still some major differences. Uh, today, the descendants of the Anabaptists are still around. Mennonites are still around today, as well as are the Amish and maybe some other similar groups. So those are the descendants of the Anabaptists. But uh, the Baptists themselves are not direct descendants of, excuse me, of the Anabaptists. And then we have uh, another group that arose a little bit later in England, and these are known as the Particular Baptists. And the particular Baptists are the ones who believed in a particular redemption, meaning Christ died with the uh, intention of saving, actually saving, not merely making salvation possible, but actually saving God's elect people. So these are Calvinistic Baptists. And their, the first particular Baptist church uh, began in England in 1638, so about 30 years behind the general Baptists. Early leaders of the particular Baptists were 
probably a lot of names you've never heard of. Uh, John Spilsbury, William Kiffin. Um, one you, you have heard of, John Bunyan, is an early particular Baptist, but it is debatable whether or not he fully belongs in the Baptist camp because his church actually practiced, it practiced only believers' baptism, but it allowed into membership those who had not been baptized as believers, but those who had been baptized as infants. And so uh, ultimately that church did end up be becoming uh, basically Presbyterian anyway over time. So John Bunyan's debatable, but at least uh, he argued for believers' baptism alone. Particular Baptists became the largest group among the two, and the Particular Baptists became uh, the group that ultimately descend, uh, descended down to this day in the Southern Baptist Convention. We are the descendants of the Particular Baptists. Uh, David Bebbington has a great book on the history of the Baptists. I think it's just called Baptists Through the Centuries, if you wanted to read more on this. But he summarizes uh, this uh, chapter on Baptists and the Reformation by saying this, Baptists were the people who took Reformation principles to their ultimate conclusion. I think that's a good way to think about it. The Baptists were the ones who saw that the church was in, in need of reform, that that reform had already progressed to a certain degree, but then they said it just hasn't gone far enough yet, mostly because it's been so tied up with the state. And when you're tied up with the state, you're often constrained by the state. And so being free from the state freed them to go farther than any of the magisterial reform groups had gone before. So that's just an overview of the history. I want to talk now about the beliefs and the practices of early Baptists and what that has to say to us today. I would argue that central to a Baptist theology is the distinction between the church and the world. That's central to our understanding of what it means to be Baptist. We argue for a strong distinction between the church and the world. And that distinction is enforced by the practice of regenerate church membership. So I'm going to put that on the board. That's the key, I think, to Baptist understanding of the church. Regenerate church membership. Regenerate, of course, would refer to being born again. So the argument is that only those who are born again, or at least those who profess to being born again, should be members of a church. Only those, no others, should be welcomed into the membership of a church except those who are born again. That's the principle of regenerate church membership. I want to give some background to this idea before we progress and see how does that affect your church practices. Theologians have long distinguished between two concepts, the universal church and the local church. And I think that's a good biblical distinction. The universal church would be all believers of all times and places who will ultimately be gathered to Christ at the end. That is the church in its ultimate expression. Local churches, on the other hand, are actually organized bodies of believers uh, who meet together in covenant with one another. They... they um, they represent the universal church in any given location. So uh, there's a distinction between universal and local. Going all the way back to Augustine, Augustine argued that the church in this present age is a corpus per mixtum, a mixed body. That is, there are both believers and unbelievers in <laughs> local churches. He took that for granted. He argued that, uh, he, of course, he did argue that baptism causes regeneration, but for Augustine, there's no guarantee that once you've been baptized, you're, you're always going to stay that way. So uh, you might fall away from that. So there, there'd be many who were baptized members of the church who are no longer regenerate. And so that means that the church becomes a mixed body of believers and unbelievers. And it's going to stay that way uh, until the end, until the city of God is completely separated out from the city of man. Well, Reformed churches ended up picking up on this idea during the Reformation. Uh, this idea of the corpus per mixtum, and they used it to make an argument for their idea of baptism, which is similar to Augustine's, but also different. They argued for infant baptism, but they didn't believe that it regenerated necessarily. And so they argued that baptism 
brings the infant child of believers into the covenant people, but doesn't guarantee anything about regeneration. So the infant might be an unbeliever, probably is in many cases, but he's still a church member. So therefore, by definition, we don't practice regenerate church membership in the Reformed churches. And they argued that this is okay, this is biblical, because Israel was a mixed body of believers and unbelievers in the Old Testament. That's pretty clear, isn't it? In fact, mostly unbelievers in Israel. There's only a remnant of the faithful in Israel. So because we are under the same covenant today, the covenant of grace, remember from last week, the one covenant of grace that is given in different forms, since we're under the same covenant today, the nature of the covenant people has not essentially changed. It's still a mixed body of believers and unbelievers. And the covenant sign of circumcision that was given to children in the old covenant is now changed to baptism given to children in the new covenant. Um, Reformed theology, I don't want to communicate by saying this, I don't want to give the impression that Reformed theology doesn't care about the holiness of the church. They absolutely do. They, they want the church to be holy. Uh, they argue for holiness. They, they argue for church discipline. So uh, even if you're bringing in unbelievers through the front door of baptism uh, as infants, they, they would trust in the process of church discipline eventually to take them out if they don't follow Christ years later. So they do care about the holiness of the church. But Baptists have critiqued the Reformed churches, specifically on their practices. Baptists would say, your practices are not the best way and not the most biblical way to ensure that the church is holy. And Baptists have seized on the promise specifically of the New Covenant. In Jeremiah 31, 34, that's, that's the one place in the Old Testament where the phrase New Covenant is used. That's in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Specifically in verse 34, God promises about this New Covenant that all who belong to it will know the Lord. Everyone who belongs to the New Covenant will know the Lord. That's why the structure of the covenant has essentially changed. So in other words, if, if you want to just simplify it and, uh, and think in terms of what is the, the main difference in, in covenantal understanding between Reformed and Baptist, Reformed believers would, would um, argue that the New Covenant is a new administration of the one covenant of grace that was always there from Abraham on. Baptists would say, no, the new covenant is actually new. It's actually a new covenant, not just a new administration of the same covenant. And, that's, and because it's a, new, it's a new covenant altogether, the people who belong to it are a new people. The church is something new in uh, God's plan of redemption that, that begins on the day of Pentecost. And so all who belong to the church should know the Lord. All, all who are members of a local church uh, should give evidence that they know the Lord by a credible profession of faith. And the sign of the covenant, the sign of the new covenant, of, of entering into the new covenant, baptism, should only be applied to those who make a credible profession. Now, Baptists would acknowledge, of course, that the church is still a mixed body. Even with these practices, the church remains a mixed body because we cannot read hearts perfectly, can we? Uh, so we still acknowledge the reality of a mixed body, but in our ecclesiological practices, we seek to conform the church as closely as humanly possible. That we seek to make the, the local church as close as it can possibly be, could possibly be in human terms to the universal church. The universal church is all believers and only believers. So we believe the local church should be a manifestation of that as close as we can make it in our practices. So what are some implications then of regenerate church membership? I think of it as regenerate church membership is the centerpiece and the implications flow from it in all these different directions. So one of them would be the baptism of believers only. Or perhaps even we should say the baptism of confessors only because some of them may not be true believers, but they're confessing faith, and as far as we can tell, they're true believers. Uh, baptism is what makes you a member of the church. We can only assume you are regenerate if you make a credible profession of faith. Baptism is, therefore, a public testimony of faith. 
and is a voluntary act that cannot be rightly applied to infants. Infants are not capable of making a public testimony of faith and therefore have no claim to baptism. So believer's baptism is, of course, a distinguishing practice among Baptists. Actually, believer's baptism was practiced by the general Baptists in the beginning by pouring or sprinkling. Uh, and it was in the particular Baptist churches, in particular, you see what I did there, that, um, that immersion became the uh, common mode. And, and of course, our practice as a church today is to baptize only by immersion because we believe that fits the, the New Testament teaching of what baptism is. So uh, baptism of professing believers only is one major implication. Uh, the second is what I'm calling here meaningful church membership and pastoral oversight. Now let's think through this for a minute. Meaningful church membership and pastoral oversight. The Church of England was organized into parishes. A parish is basically uh, an ecclesiastical territory. And everybody who lives in it is automatically counted a member of the state church. Well, if you end up in a situation like that, then you just belong to the church in whatever place where you're born. You're baptized into it early in your, your life as an infant, and you just belong to it as a matter of course. And it's not surprising that pastoral practice in this kind of setting was often abysmal in the Church of England. Um, let's, let's think about this. You're, as a pastor, you're not really worried that they're going to run off and go join some other church. Uh, you don't have to compete for your members, right? Uh, it's just, that's just the system. And people, of course, tended to stay in one place their whole lives. So um, you've just got a situation where there's not a lot of incentive for pastors necessarily to give good oversight. There were some pastors who tried to correct this. Uh, Richard Baxter wrote a book called The Reform Pastor where he argued that a pastor needs to be visiting every single member of his parish uh, over a certain amount of time and catechizing them and so forth. And you read it and you realize, how could he ever have time to preach if he's doing that? Um, so Richard Baxter, he should have called it the Superman pastor, uh, but he called it the Reform pastor. And uh, so you've just got a situation where uh, it's very easy to see how oversight might not be very diligent. Me membership in the church doesn't mean a whole lot. So, and, and that's because church membership's involuntary. It's just a part of your identity from birth. Uh, by contrast, membership in a Baptist church means that you've actually committed yourself to that particular church. You're not born into a Baptist church. The Baptist church doesn't claim you as a member because you live in a particular territory, they require you to actually voluntarily commit yourself and to say, I, I covenant with this body to be part and to submit to its authority and its oversight and its pastors. Uh, and I commit myself to serve this body, to worship with them and to be part of uh, this particular church in its life together. Uh, in other words, it was a covenantal commitment, a voluntary covenantal commitment that was meaningful. You were actually submitting yourself to authority, to oversight. And uh, this, is, this is in very marked contrast to many churches today, even especially Baptist churches, I think, where joining a church in our context is still a voluntary act, but it's largely considered more from a consumer mindset. What can this church give me? And, uh, and if this church doesn't give me what I think I want, I'll go and I'll look at other churches. What can that church give me? Well, that one offers this, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't really compare. So, so we, come, we become comparison church shoppers with a consumer mentality. And uh, joining the church in the New Testament, and I think this aligns very well with early Baptist theology, is, is really an act of submitting yourself to that local congregation's authority and committing yourself to the good of that local body. So you're not just seeking what you can get out of it, but what can I give as well? How can I, as a member of this church, fulfill my obligations to this body of believers that may need me? And, and in submission to the authority of its leadership and the congregation as a whole, 
how can I obey Christ in my life? That's a much richer, I think, biblical picture of what it means to join a church. And therefore, membership is meaningful. Oversight is therefore meaningful. Pastors know that they are overseeing those who have committed themselves covenantally to the body and therefore in doing so have asked to be held accountable to that covenant. When you join a Baptist church, ideally, you should be saying with your act of joining, I want this church to hold me accountable to what I'm doing here. And that's why, of course, here we have you sign a church covenant that says that, uh, that you submit yourself to the authority of the church so that it may hold you accountable to what you've pledged to do. So membership is meaningful. It's not just like joining a club where, I mean, even if you join a club, you still have to pay your dues every year and, or else you'll get taken off the list. Many churches, you don't have to do anything. You can die and you're still a member. Um, we've, we've really lost this idea of meaningful church membership in our day. And this is something that, that the early Baptists can really help us regain if we look to their example. A third issue is congregational church government. the argument that it is the local church as a congregation that holds the final authority in terms of human authority. Christ, of course, is the head of the church, but the local congregation uh, has the final authority to make its own decisions regarding its own affairs, practices, and membership. The argument for this, the way that this is implied from regenerate church membership, is from the argument that, that if all members are regenerate, all members have the Spirit. All members are therefore sharers in the priesthood of Christ. This, is, this gets back to the, the Reformation teaching of the priesthood of all believers, that there's not a special category of priests who are above all the laity, but that in Christ all believers are priests. All believers therefore have the Spirit, and all believers are in principle capable of, under the guidance of the Spirit, leading the church uh, as a collective body. It doesn't mean, of course, that the con local congregation is infallible, just like no local presbytery would be infallible, and no pope is infallible. Uh, even, even Catholics would say it's not infallible all the time, just when he wants to be, basically, uh, which is very rare. So that's, that's, at least that's a good thing. Um, this means that the congregation has the authority to call its elders and deacons to lead it and to assist in its affairs while retaining the authority tr entrusted to them with Christ giving the church the power of the keys. We saw that in, in uh, Matthew 18 here where, where uh, Christ says in verse 18, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is actually an echo of what he'd earlier said in chapter 16 where he said to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Here he seems to be giving that same delegated authority to the local church as a whole. Notice in our text we saw that Jesus said the final step in church discipline is not tell it to the bishop or tell it to the pope or tell it to the presbytery. He said tell it to the church. The local church is to have the final authority in the matter of its membership. When Paul calls upon the church at Corinth to discipline the man who's shacking up with his stepmother, in 1 Corinthians 5, he does not say, I as an apostle have disciplined this man. What he says is, when you gather together, you must hand this man over to Satan. You as the local church, it is your job, your authority, and you must do it. So the biblical teaching seems to align not only from the, uh, the logical conclusion of regenerate church membership, but the biblical teaching actually gives us examples where congregational authority is the final court of appeal in terms of the, the affairs of a local congregation. All right, so uh, that's a third one. The fourth one would be church discipline, which uh, I just alluded to. Church discipline is an implication of regenerate church membership. Not to say that other churches don't practice it, but it, it just seems to fit more neatly with an idea of regenerate church membership. The church has authority from Christ to oversee its members. And if any member breaks the church covenant and walks in unrepentant sin, he must either be corrected 
or if he refuses to repent, he must be removed as a member. And Matthew 18 makes that clear, as does 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, and there are other texts that we could point to as well that make this principle clear. And there are basically three reasons, uh, if not more, that we could articulate for why a church needs to practice discipline in this way. The first, it would, it would be to awaken the sinner to the gravity of his sin, pro provoking him to repentance. That's the hope. In fact, Paul explicitly says that in 1 Corinthians 5 when he tells the congregation to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of Christ. So the idea is that having been put outside the protection of the church, let, it, let Satan have his way with him, that may be the only thing that can wake him up to his need to repent so that he comes back. It's not a guarantee, but it's the, the last resort we have. And that's one major hope. And whenever we discipline someone, we're hoping that outside the church, they will be awakened to the gravity of sin and come back and repent. But church discipline, even if it doesn't always accomplish that, it always does accomplish guarding the church from sinful influences. Uh, we don't want our church members to think, well, so-and-so is walking in unrepentant sin and nothing seems to be happening, so that must mean I can too. And sin has a, a leavening influence in a body when it's not dealt with. And so uh, we want to protect the church from sinful influences so that the church can maintain its distinction from the world. We don't want the church as a whole to be following in the sinful practices of the world. And then a third issue, a third reason for church discipline is to protect the church's public witness. If the church is maintained as distinct from the world, as a, a group of people who order them, their lives in a different kind of way, and discipline is pursued not in a holier-than-thou fashion, not in a prideful way, but in a humble, loving way, then it presents a very powerful testimony to the world that we take our faith seriously, that following Jesus matters to us. And uh, it actually ends up helping the witness of the church. People think, people think the exact opposite today. They think, well, if we discipline people, we're going to scare people off. Nobody's going to want to come to this church. And it's exactly the opposite. It's, it's when we allow ourselves to become like the world that nobody wants to come to our church. You ever noticed how empty liberal churches are today? They don't have anything distinctive to say to the world. Why, why are you going to go to a liberal church? if they're just saying the same thing the world is saying, just with less entertainment value. It is a distinctive people that will present a more powerful witness for Christ. And here I want to quote from, from Allie and Sam's dad, Greg Wills, who literally wrote the book on church discipline uh, in his dissertation, Democratic Religion. Um, he argued that in the antebellum South, Baptist churches excommunicated on average 2% of their membership per year. Kicked out 2% of their members. Now, some of that was over silly, stupid stuff, like so-and-so played the fiddle on a Sunday. You know, I've seen church records that say that. Obviously, they, they had some scruples we wouldn't share today. But they excommunicated 2% of their membership per year, and they grew in membership about twice as much as the general population. Today, we can't even keep up with the growth of the population. Baptists in the antebellum South surpassed it. And they did so, I think, largely because they were a distinctive community of people. They presented a witness of, of holiness. We, we do have a concern for the lives of our members, and we are willing to, to love them enough to correct them when they go wrong. Discipline is not about, as I said, it's not about judging people, being holier than thou. It's about loving people. Just like a parent disciplines his children because he loves them, church, churches must discipline their members because they love them. And by the way, I would argue 99% of church discipline should be taking place behind the scenes. 99% of it should be just two believers talking together. Hey, what's going on in your life? You know, you really do need to address this. Let me help you with that. And then there's repentance, and it doesn't have to go any further. That's where church discipline needs to be happening all the time in our relationships, in our small groups, and only the very few cases should ever be made public. The very few cases where 
the sin is so entrenched and unrepentant that it has to be brought out into the light. That, those, are the only, those, those ought to be the few, not the, the many. The, the 1644 London Baptist Confession, the confession of seven particular Baptist churches in England said, Christ has likewise given power to His whole church to receive in and cast out by way of excommunication any member, and this power is given to every particular congregation and not one particular person, either member or officer, but the whole. So it's an implication again of regenerate church membership that the church as a whole participates in disciplining its own members. One final implication here and then we'll wrap up. Baptists have always held to a principle of separation of church and state. <clears throat> now when I say that, I don't mean the way the ACLU interprets that to mean if you say God in a public square somewhere, you're violating someone's rights. Uh, what I mean by this is that the church is to be governed apart from state influence and the state is to be governed apart from direct church influence. Obviously the church will influence the culture and the state through the, the uh, actions of its individual members, but the church as an ecclesiastical authority is not to get mixed up in the affairs of the state and vice versa. So uh, there's a separation here. The, the magisterial reformation kept these two things close together and practiced infant baptism, I believe, in part because it was a state-sponsored movement. And therefore, if you're a king and you're ruling over a particular realm and you belong to, say, the Lutheran faith, you want all of your subjects to be Lutheran as well. And so all those who are born into your realm end up being baptized Lutheran. Uh, because that's just where they're born. Be baptism is a function of state authority at that point. That's why, by the way, those who practiced believer's baptism were feared so much that they were persecuted because they were actually opposing the state authority in, in doing that and rejecting infant baptism. So Baptists have always been a group that operated apart from the power of the state. Church and state have different spheres of authority. And, and for this reason, Baptists have always upheld the principle of religious liberty. Uh, Baptists have never, thankfully, have never been on the persecuting side of persecution. They've, they've been on the receiving end of it, but they've never been a persecuting people because we believe in uh, religious liberty, that, that only God is Lord of our conscience. No state official uh, can actually uh, force us to conform our worship to uh, any particular form. And so this is what's known as the free church or the gathered church as opposed to a parish system or a state church. And that's a fifth implication here. So in conclusion here, um, Cornerstone, are, we ourselves are part of a movement that's uh, actually gaining in strength, I think, today, uh, owing largely to ministries such as Nine Marks and leadership of men such as Mark Dever and others. Uh, we're part of a movement to restore and recover the historic Baptist vision of the church. And the reason we are is because we believe that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, we, we don't do this because this is our heritage. We believe our heritage happens to align in this particular instance with Scripture. And the Bible is what is leading us to seek to recover this historic vision. Um, modern Baptist churches on the whole seem to have fallen very far from this vision and especially with regard to meaningful membership and discipline. Uh, this, this seems to be very foreign to modern Baptist churches today. But imagine what the future will hold as the world becomes more and more hostile to the Christian faith and the separation between the church and the world becomes more and more apparent simply because the world is moving in a, in a different direction. Um, just imagine what the future will hold as this movement continues to grow, as churches continue to get stronger and as we continue to plant more churches that live according to this vision, imagine the distinctive witness that we can present and uh, imagine the disciples that we can make in fulfillment of the Great Commission if we have strong and healthy churches uh, who are the platform upon which to launch this mission. So are there any questions or comments this morning? Clint.
of operating by Scripture alone and the glory of God alone with regards to the end of Scripture. Um, the question yeah. that I have is, I mean, I can imagine a little bit of what church discipline might look like in a church as large as like where John Piper pastors Bethlehem Baptist or whatever, um, and as cornerstone, uh, you know, we are gaining membership, praise the Lord. Um, yes, I think it might be easy in the midst of, let's say that I see something in Matt's life and I want to approach him about that, and Matt thinks that, hey, I'm, I'm walking in some fellowship with some other people and they're holding me accountable. And Matt's like, man, I really just don't have time to talk to him about this. And not trying to be ugly to me, you know, but I mean, how do we deal with that a little bit as we grow and get bigger? Because we truly can't necessarily, I don't see how we can practically be in the same amount of covenant relationship with everybody. Right, else. yeah. So, so that's, you know, how do we okay. do that? Go ahead. So I'll just sum. Yeah, I'll just summarize the question: How do we, how do we discipline well as we get bigger, and not everybody can really even know everybody else? Uh, and our, our vision is not that everybody necessarily knows everybody, but that everybody is known by somebody, right? And so that that's why we organize into small groups. Small groups are huge here because small groups uh, provide a natural context within which that can, or a structured context when that, within that, which that can happen in addition to whatever natural context there is. So small gr groups give a structure for a more individualized oversight. And I think we, we, we have to trust the structure we've established and uh, trust the natural relationships as well. Uh, and, and it's entirely possible that a number of things might never come to light that, that could have perhaps in a smaller church, but I think that's just a risk we take when we when we fulfill the Great Commission and make more disciples in our own body, right? So um, there are going to be strengths and weaknesses to any church size model and different different um, challenges that each one faces. So I guess the challenge as the church gets bigger is for uh, for people not to disappear in the crowd. And so as pastors, we do our best to try to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, by connecting people as, as best we can. All right, maybe one more. Yeah, Dave. You mentioned um, consumer church membership or church yeah. outreach. And I think that um, maybe it's just a, a comment, but uh, it seems like when we, um, my family came here is, is, uh, as consumers, right? We saw that this, this is something that is um, good. The church is, is teaching the gospel preaching the gospel um, and and has a uh, an understanding of church membership that right. the other way. Um, and I think there's this at one point I, I think for me I struggled on the other side of that. I don't see where I fit into the puzzle and how I am giving back to the body. And so can you maybe you can speak to how people are in that position that I feel like Aaron was talking to me about being a consumer. <laughs> um, what, what, what can they do if they feel like, oh man, am I the guy that walked in the door and just yeah, yeah. this up? Yeah, the, the, uh, good question. So about the consumer mindset. The consumer mindset comment was, was aimed more at um, those who are seeking superficial things, like what's the music style? Or, or things like, what, what are my personal preferences rather than what does the scripture teach about what, how the church should be ordered? So, so there's obviously, whenever you go to a new setting and you've got to pick a church, there's certainly a, a little bit of consumer mentality that has to go into that, right? So that's unavoidable. Um, but what I, what I was urging is don't think entirely in terms of what can I get, but also what can I give? And uh, that may not always be clear in the beginning. And sometimes you learn that, you only learn that over time by being a part of a church, right? And I think, Dave, in your case, uh, you've learned you have a lot to give. Uh, and and you've, you've shown investment in a lot of different lives. So I think as you begin to build relationships with people and uh, as you see needs in the body, 
uh, you begin to say, uh, God brought me here for this, and, uh, and this is where uh, I'm going to serve Him faithfully. And so, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of that is going to be subjective as well, just as the Holy Spirit guides uh, in more subjective ways. Uh, you, you may not know at the very beginning why God's calling you to a place, but over time He makes that clear. All right, one more, Bill. Well, I, I'm just going to add to what okay, go ahead. said. Um, the, a lot of church, well, churches have uh, in the 20th century gotten, <coughs> and it's continuing to the 21st, uh, have gotten into having a program for this and a program right. for that. And so the, the cons- that's part of the consumer mentality. You go and you look and see what programs there are. Right. Right. Um, not that I'm going to be a leader in this area or that, but but I connect with this person who is a part of my local church, and uh, they need help from me in a spiritual or physical way, and I need help from them in a spiritual or physical way, and we're all centered around uh, gospel ministry, whether it's um, you know contributing money to something or time to something or being a listener. Right. Giving wise counsel or, or providing oversight. We are not program driven. We are um, church community gospel driven. Right. And and that's uh, a change of mindset when you come from a different church. You look if you look for programs. Yeah, you're more of a consumer. If you're looking to invest in the people at this body, and the body is giving you the preaching of the word. Then that's the better of the two. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Very edifying comment. Um, I'll just repeat it briefly for the live stream um, that perhaps we could think of the difference in a consumer mentality as related to programming. So if you're if you're going to church just for its programs, it has something for this group or this group or this group. Um, that would be more reflective of what can I get versus a church that values more the investment in individuals, in individualized relationship. And uh, at Cornerstone, of course, we, we do have programs, but we, we try not to multiply them. We don't want to overload our people with programs because programs in and of themselves can just become dead weight on a church. Um, we, we develop programs where they're needed, where a mission, where they can help fulfill our mission. Uh, but we are very much more driven, I think, by the, the ties of individual relationships and investing in one another as fellow church members. So uh, that's a very good way to put that bill and a good way to end for today. So um, next week will be Clint Smith and then Michael Lee, and then we'll conclude this series with two more lessons after that. So you're dismissed.